Yo, what's up guys? Alf here, and today I've got a bit of a different video from normal. So, I normally do deck guide videos, but today I'm going to be doing more of a deep dive on the pros and cons of playing best of one versus best of three on Arena, and ultimately why I definitely think you should be playing best of three if you're playing competitively. Now, obviously this is different from the usual deck guide videos that I do, so if this is the kind of video you want me to do more of in the future, definitely let me know in the comments below. And now before I get into it, I do want to preface this by saying that everything I'm talking about in this video is purely from a competitive standpoint, so if you're somebody who just plays Arena for fun, or your end goal isn't just to win as much as possible then just disregard everything I'm going to say here you know that's the beauty of magic you don't always have to just play to win all the time but if you're somebody who does play competitively which I imagine most people who watch my channel do then this kind of video is aimed at you, especially if you're somebody who just plays best of one. And the main reason I wanted to make this video was just because I feel like there are a lot of people who get into competi competitive magic from best of one because it's the easiest way to get into it. But they're hesitant to make that jump to best of three, either because of barriers to entry or some misconceptions about the format as well. So in this video, I wanted to break down, you know, my thoughts on it, because there is a lot of stuff about best of one that a lot of people don't really think about. And ultimately, I think if you make that switch to best of three, not only are you going to get better at the game, but it's also much more fun to play as a format, in my opinion, as well. But anyway, let's just go straight into it. I'm going to start off by talking about the positives of best of one, some counterpoints to those positives, and then we're going to talk about the negatives after that. So first of all, I think the biggest reason why people play best of one is that it's just less of a time commitment. So if you're someone who's only got, you know, maybe 20 or 30 minutes to play arena, it's typically safer to play best of one because you know you can be fairly confident you're going to be able to get one or two games in that time whereas best of three you know the matches can go up to an hour in best of three each player has a 30 minute chess clock so if you run out of time there you just end up losing so in theory the games can end up going a full hour but that is very unlikely and you also have to be playing a pretty specific deck for that to happen you know the decks that spring to mind for me personally are sacrifice decks I remember the old Golgari food deck was notorious for the mirror matches going on for nearly an hour or maybe like an angel's life gain deck where the mirror matches can end up with both players over a thousand life and an absolutely huge board you know sometimes control mirror matches can get close to that as well but for the most part those are outliers games really don't take that long very often and also there are certain decks that you can play that that will basically never happen you know I've never even got close to the hour mark playing an aggro deck for example so for the most part I think on average best of three games can take anywhere between you know 10 and 25 minutes so it's really not that bad and I also think in general that the pace of play in best of three is generally going to be faster anyway because I think you know this is obviously a generalization but most players who play best of three are generally more serious they probably have more experience with their deck as well in general so I think the pace of play is generally faster so if you're somebody who plays best of one and you think our oh, best of three is just going to take three times as long I don't necessarily think that's the case really uh, another really big reason why I think people tend to avoid best of three is because building sideboards and sideboarding are both very difficult skills. You know, I'm, I'm someone who's played a ton of magic and I definitely think that those are the two hardest parts of the game for sure so especially if you're someone who's just played best of one that first hurdle of not only having to build your own sideboard but then figure out how to sideboard as well is very very difficult but I think there's a fairly easy way around that and that is to just copy a deck with a sideboard guide there are tons and tons of sideboard guides out there every article that I've posted on MTGA zone or reddit has a sideboard guide whether that's the old guides that I posted on the free site or the newer ones on the premium site there's sideboard guides there loads of them are available online and even though I'm not a fan of religiously following sideboard guides because I think sideboarding is more of an art than a science, you should be changing what you do depending on the exact list your opponent has. So say for example a sideboard guide says to cut all your creature removal against control, that's generally right to do, but if your opponent is playing a control deck, you know, say you're playing Historic and the opponent's playing Esper Control with Diviner of Fates or and Kaleem, that's an example where you should probably keep in some of your creature removal in order to deal with Diviner of Fates for example, or if you think the opponent is likely to be running creatures like uh, Lyra Dawnbringer or Baneslayer Angel Post Sideboard, then you should maybe think about keeping some ways to deal with those in as well. So, while I don't think it's a good idea to religiously stick to sideboard guides, I think they're very useful as a starting point. So, if you're somebody who plays best of one and you're, you know, you're kind of worried that it's going to be a very difficult thing to do to build your own sideboard just copy what someone else has done as a starting point and then as you play and you get more comfortable with it you'll be able to make your own decisions from there so don't let that put you off uh, additionally you know most players who play competitively on arena 
they have their end goal of trying to play at these big events. So on Arena, those the, the two main big events that you can play in is either the Arena Opens or the Qualifiers, and both of those are best of three. I know Arena Open Day 1 is sometimes best of one, but Day 2 is best of three, the entire of the Qualifier is best of three, uh, the second playing event is also best of three. So if you're somebody who just plays best of one and you do end up qualifying for one of these events, it's going to be very difficult to suddenly switch to best of three. So I think if you start playing now and then you do end up qualifying, you're going to be in a much better position when you do make those big events in the end. Uh, another big reason why uh, people play best of one is because there are certain decks that only really work in best of one. So this is the first deck we're going to look at here, and it's best of one Dragonstorm deck in Historic. So this is basically a deck that is very all in on the graveyard. So the way this deck works, I'm not going to explain absolutely everything about it, but the general gist of this deck is that you spend your first three turns setting up your graveyard, and then on turn four you either cast a Mizzix Mastery or an Unburial Rites on the Scholar of the Lost Troves to try and cast Dragonstorm, and then win with an infinite combo with Bladewing the Arisen and Terror of the Peaks. And this is a deck that just doesn't really work in best of three at all, because it's very, very vulnerable to graveyard hate. Now in best of one, there is very little graveyard hate in general, you know, most decks don't play graveyard hate, and the ones that do play graveyard hate can't really afford to run that much of it, because then they'll just be dead draws against other decks that aren't using the graveyard. So this Dragonstorm deck really takes advantage of that. If you try to run this deck in best of three, it really wouldn't work because graveyard hate is in basically every sideboard. Plus people can also bring in stuff like discard spells or counter spells against you from their sideboard. So this deck just really wouldn't work in best of three because post sideboard the opponent is going to have answers to what you're doing and it just shuts down your deck basically. So these sorts of decks are very single-minded, they're very focused on doing one thing and building the whole deck around that, and in, typical, in, in general those sorts of decks don't really translate well into best of three because if the opponent has a card in their sideboard that shuts down what you're trying to do, your whole deck just ceases to work at that point basically. So this is the main reason why I play best of one when I do, is if I come up with a deck idea that I think is really cool but wouldn't work in best of three because of sideboard cards, but the, the main difference but th this kind of results in a pretty big difference in the meta games between best of one and best of three. And this is something that people who just play best of one might not even realize, that in basically every format in Arena, the best of one and best of three meta games are really different. First of all, because of the existence of decks like this that don't really exist in best of three and aren't really accounted for. And second of all, because best of one really incentivizes you to build your deck in a linear way. I'm going to explain more of this later, but the point I'm trying to make here is that the metagames are very different, and so, you know, another reason why people often play best of one is to test a deck out before they play it in best of three, but I don't even really think that's a good idea because of the big difference in metagames, you know. I think a lot of the 60 card best of three decks aren't really going to do well in best of one, either because they rely on their sideboard to improve certain matchups, um, or because they just don't take into account decks like Dragonstorm that don't really exist in best of three, if that makes sense. Um, and so I'm going to highlight two different builds of a deck, which is Historic Goblins. I'm going to show you the best of one and the best of three deck, and we'll have a look at the differences. And I think this should hopefully really highlight the difference in deck building ethos between the two formats as well, because I think the most important thing to understand between best of one and best of three is that best of one really, really incentivizes you to build the deck in a more linear way and a less interactive way. So this is best of three goblins. This is my Rakdos goblins deck that I posted uh, a couple months ago now that a lot of people have picked up. This is one of the highest win rate lists in best of three according to untapped at the moment. And this is basically a goblins deck which has a lot going on. Um, but this build compared to the best of one version is much more built like a mid-range deck that has access to kind of combo burst and sacrifice synergies as well. But the point I'm trying to get across here when I go through the deck is that in best of three, you can afford to build a much more balanced deck that can interact with the opponent, whereas in best of one, you can't really do that without making yourself worse, making your deck worse in other ways. So, if we have a look at the sideboard here, uh, first of all, we've got Goblin Trashmaster. So, in historic, two of the top decks right now are. Blue-White Affinity and Red-White Thopters, which are both decks that are 
almost entirely built around artifacts. And one of the main reasons why Goblins is decent right now is because Goblin Trash Master is absolutely insane against both of those decks. So you can sacrifice a Goblin to destroy an artifact, which is really, really powerful when you have a ton of ways to get a bunch of Goblins into play pretty quickly. Um, now the issue with this in best of one is, if you wanted to improve those matchups against Affinity or Thopters, you would have to run Goblin Trash Master in your main deck. And the issue with doing that is, it's absolutely insane against the Affinity and the Thopter deck, but it just makes you, you know, it's just pretty bad against everything else. You know, it's just a four mana Lord at that point against any other deck that isn't running artifacts. You know, similarly, we've got Graveyard Hate in the sideboard, so... You know, this is obviously going to be good against decks like, is it Phoenix or Kethis Combo or, you know, Dragonstorm, for example. But you can't really afford to run this in your main deck in best of one because not only does it, it's basically a dead draw against any deck that isn't using the graveyard, but it also dilutes your Muxus hits. It means you're going to get worse hits off Conspicuous Snoop and Runveld Horde Master as well. So you really can't afford to be running this in the main deck, which means that you're not going to have a way to stop decks like Dragonstorm or Reanimator that are basically just built around the graveyard. So Goblins is going to have a really, really hard time beating a deck like Dragonstorm or Reanimator without putting this in the main deck. But if you do put it in the main deck, then it makes you worse against everything else. Another very popular deck in the format right now is Is It Wizards? And that's a deck that I think Goblins struggles to deal with in general, but at least in the best of three version, you have access to Fatal Push in the sideboard, which is really, really strong in that matchup at slowing them down, slowing down their really fast starts to give you a foothold in the game because you have a much better late game as the game goes on. So Fatal Push is really important against a deck like that, or Auras in general, which is another deck that's very good, you know, single target removal is very good against. But again, same with all the other cards, you can't really afford to be running Fatal Push in your main deck in best of one because it's just going to be a dead card against the control decks, and it's also going to dilute your Muxus, Runveld, Horde Master, and Snoop hits as well. So the point I'm trying to get across here is that if you change your main deck to interact with the opponent to try and improve a specific matchup, it makes your matchups worse against everything else in best of one. And so the way to get around this, or the way to maximize your deck without making e any specific matchup worse, is to just build your deck as linear as possible and have as little interaction as possible, because then it doesn't really matter, you know, if you make your deck just full of goblins, which I'll, I'll, I might as well show you the best of one list while I'm talking about it now, but this is how I would build goblins in best of one, and it is all just as linear as possible. There's basically no interaction here, and the reason for that is, like I showed in the best of three version, if you run Fatal Push in the main deck to help against wizards, you make your deck worse against every other deck where Fatal Push isn't as good. It also makes your Muxus hits worse, makes Snoop worse, makes Runveld Horde Master worst. If you put Trash Master in your main deck to improve the affinity matchup, it's just a worse card, you know, it's a f another 4 mana card that doesn't have as nearly as much impact as Krenko does. If you try to run Graveyard Hate in your main deck to stop decks like Dragonstorm or Reanimator, then that's just a dead draw against any deck that isn't using the graveyard. Again, it hurts your Muxus odds, hurts your Snoop odds, hurts your Horde Master odds. So the best thing to do on balance is to just make your deck as linear as possible. Just make it all focused around your Goblin synergies, and then it doesn't matter. You're not going to have dead cards in a matchup. You're just doing your proactive thing as much as possible. And this is the really, really big difference between best of one and best of three. Um, and because of this, I think that best of one just generally is not as fun to play because there's less counterplay. It's just tons and tons of linear decks that are not trying to interact. You know, the only interaction that's really ever run in best of one is interaction that works well with your deck's linear game plan. So for example, the the artifact decks all run portable hole and they can get away with this hold on the wrong colour there. They can get away with running portable hole because it's an artifact. So it plays in with all of their other artifact synergies. You know, it makes the thought monitor co cost less. It gives them more of a buff of Mashiko's Reign of Truth. It's a card that you can hit off in Genius Smith. You know, in the case of the Enchantress decks, they can afford to run Candle Trap as early interaction because it's an enchantment so even if you're up against a deck like control where they have no creatures you can still put candle trap on your creatures to draw you cards off Sithis or enchantress's presence make your sanctum weaver tap for more mana so my, the point i'm trying to make here you know a, another quick example as well is you know burn spells like wizard's lightning um that's a uh, that's another card that the Wizards deck can afford to run because their whole deck is built around creatures that trigger when you play non-creature spells. So you want to play burn spells because it makes your Soul Scar Mage bigger, it makes it triggers your Symmetry Sage, um, and these can also be used to go face if you don't need to kill creatures as well. So the whole point I'm trying to make here is that best of one is generally all built around 
super linear decks that are trying to be as l little, you know, running as little interaction as possible because interaction needs to be the right kind for it to be effective. This is the main reason why low synergy mid-range decks aren't really a big part of best of one because they rely on their interaction lining up well. You know, you could have discard spells like Thoughtseize or Duress that are good against control and combo decks, but they're pretty bad against aggro. You could have single target removal that's good against wizards and auras, but that's generally bad against a deck like elves and goblins. You can have sweepers that are good against a deck like elves, but then that just does nothing against control. So the point I'm trying to make here is that interaction is very risky to run in best of one, and it leads to a format where the, the format is just full of linear decks that are kind of like two ships passing in the night, very little interaction. And on top of that, it also naturally becomes the home of the most degenerate and least interactive decks in the format. Stuff like, you know, Tybalt's Trickery when that was legal in Historic, stuff like Dragonstorm, stuff like Reanimator, stuff like Greasefang. So I generally just think that it leads to less fun play patterns where you don't really interact with the opponent, you just have to hope that you're able to race them with your linear game plan, which I don't think is particularly great gameplay personally. Um, additionally, most decks in best of one are trying to take advantage of something. Um, so for example, Elves is a very common deck in best of one in Historic, and this whole deck is basically built around... well not built around, but it's trying to take advantage of the fact that there are very little board sweepers, very little Wrath of God style effects in best of one, because this is a deck that is very fast, very linear, can kill very quickly, and because it goes wide, it gets a lot of creatures into play quickly, it's also less vulnerable to single target interaction, which is the most common interaction when it is run. So elves in general is very good against decks that don't run sweepers, but just has an absolutely horrendous matchup against control or other decks that do run sweepers. Um, you know, similarly, another deck that tries to take advantage of the lack of something in a format is Enchantress. So this is Nine Lives Solemnity Enchantress, which is basically a deck that's trying to set up the lock of Solemnity plus Nine Lives, which stops the opponent from dealing any damage to you for the rest of the game. And this deck really takes advantage of the fact that people don't run enchantment removal in their best of one decks for the most part. So once you have Nine Lives Solemnity set up, you basically just can't lose the game at that point, and then you can just win with whatever your win condition is, approach of the second sun in this case. The only real way you're losing with this deck once you have your locks set up is either if the opponent is happening to ha happening to run enchantment removal like Skyclave Apparition, or you know if you're against control, they can just completely destroy you with a card like Farewell. Um, and, you know, other cards that can stop Nine Lives, like Bonecrusher Giant, aren't run very commonly either. So, because the format is basically full of decks that are trying to take advantage of the fact that other decks aren't running specific types of interaction, it also results in these really polarizing matchups where if you're playing a deck like Elves or Enchantress, for example, you're going to be really good against other creature decks, but you just have an absolutely horrendous matchup against Control. If you queue up into Control, you're probably just going to lose. And I think Elves is a good deck that really highlights this problem because Elves is a perfectly respectable deck to be running in best of one. I think it is probably one of the best decks in the format because it's so linear, it's so good, it's very, very... Um, what's the word, resilient to single target removal, but you have an awful matchup against control, you have an awful matchup against any of the lock decks like Nine Lives Solemnity, like Ceres Emissary, because you don't run any interaction yourself, you don't have any ways to beat those sorts of decks at all. So it just leads to these scenarios where you could be playing the perfectly built elf deck and you could be playing it with no mistakes whatsoever, but you just lose because you keep queuing into control and lock decks. And while there are obviously going to be bad matchups in best of three, this is way, way less pronounced because you have the opportunity to adapt to whatever the deck the opponent is playing. So for example, the Red White Thopters deck that I posted a couple of weeks ago, that's a deck that generally has a really bad matchup against a deck like Angels. So, you know, say you're playing Red White Thopters in best of three, and you queue into an Angels deck, you're probably, you know, you're, you're unlikely to win game one unless you get very lucky. But post sideboard, because you have access to your sideboard, you can bring in four Hushbringer, which completely flips that matchup on its head. You know, similarly, if you were playing Elves in best of three, you could have access to Freyalees or other Planeswalkers, which really help to improve that matchup. So the point I'm trying to make here is that because of the decks in best of one trying to take advantage of other decks not running certain types of interaction it leads to really polarizing matchups where 
so much of whether you win or lose can be decided by what matchup you queue into, if that makes sense. So, you know, you can't control the deck you get paired up against in either best of one or best of three, but it has a much higher chance of deciding the outcome of the game in best of one. It's just more stuff that's out of your control, if that makes sense. Um, and on top of that, I also think Oh, I also think that going first versus second has a much, much bigger impact on the outcome of the game in best of one as well, because if you go, you know, say say you're playing the Dragonstorm deck, for example, I'll bring it back up again, where the whole idea of this deck is you set up for a turn four win of Mystic's Mastery or Unbury Rights. If you queue into another Dragonstorm deck, the deck is super consistent at setting up a turn four win, so just because you went second against another Dragonstorm deck, you're probably just going to lose just because you lost the die roll. And that's it, that's the whole match. You don't get another opportunity to play after that. You know, that's obviously quite an extreme example, but, you know, even outside of that, say you're playing a control deck, for example, and you're against an aggro deck, and you have a Supreme Verdict in your hand, a four mana sweeper. Um, if you ended up going second, and the opponent, the aggro opponent killed you before you untapped for your turn four, you basically lost that game because you ended up going second. Now obviously this is, again, it's going to happen in best of three as well, but it's way, way less pronounced because in, in best of three, in game two, you're going first. You know, you're guaranteed to go first if you want to, which is really huge. And then even going into game three where the opponent goes first again, because you have access to your sideboard, you can trim out the more expensive, slower cards from your deck and board in more cheap interaction, which means it's way less likely for the opponent to run you over. So the point I'm trying to make here is that in best of one, there are so many non-games where you don't really have control over the outcome of the match. Whereas in best of three, because you have more than one chance, because it's, you know, best two out of three games, and you have access to your sideboard, you're much less likely to get cheesed out and run over. And best of one in general, like I explained earlier, is full of these decks that are just trying to cheese you out, just trying to be as consistent and linear po as possible at their game plan. So there's just way less agency over the match win basically so the point i'm trying to make here is that it's even if you're playing like a perfectly built elf deck in best of one which i think is like a pretty defensible deck to be running in best of one and you played it perfectly you could still just not win any game like lose a ton of games in a row either because you got paired into a bad matchup which you don't really have any way to sort out whereas in best of three the matchup disparity is, is way less pronounced because you have access to sideboard cards which give you a way to fix those bad matchups. But additionally, you know, the difference between going first and second has so much more of an impact over the, the general course of the game. Um, and this has a really big impact when you're trying to push high on the ladder. So like I said, I know most people who play competitively, their end goal is probably to, you know, qualify for the qualifiers and then try and do their best in those. And if you're trying to do that through the ladder, it's very, very hard to push for a high spot on the ladder in best of one. The rank you gain f through best of one is pretty significantly less than best of three. And the way to get high on the ladder in best of three is to go on win streak. So say you went on like a five win win streak in best of three. To do the equivalent in best of one, you'd need to go on like a 14 or 15 game win streak. And considering how I've just explained, there's so much more variance, there's so much more stuff that's out of your control because the matchup disparity is so much bigger. And because going first or second can have such a big impact on the outcome of the game, it's way, way, way harder to go on a 14 game win streak in best of one than it is to go on a five match win streak in best of three. So. If you're someone who's trying to push for top 1200 to get your playing points or top 250 at the end of the season to try and guarantee your qualification for a qualifier, it is so, so hard to do that in best of one. Or it's it's significantly more hard to do that in best of one, in my opinion. You know, I've, I've managed to hit rank one in best of three quite a few times at this point, but I've never managed to do it past, you know, the first week where there's not as many people in Mythic. It's so much harder to get a high rank on the ladder just playing best of one for those reasons. Uh, additionally, another really big thing is that you can't really innovate that much in best of one at all. And I think this is really huge because I think one of the main reasons why I've able, sorry, one of the main reasons why I've been able to hit rank one multiple times at this point is because I'm constantly trying to come up with new ideas. And if you manage to come up with a good idea, whether that's a new deck or a new 
take on a deck or a new innovation, if you're the first person on that and people aren't prepared for it, people don't have sideboard cards for it, you know, people don't know how to play against it necessarily, that gives you such a big competitive advantage and that is a way that you could easily get on a win streak get a high spot on the ladder or you know if you innovate before a mythic qualifier potentially make it to the really really big tournaments innovation is a huge part of being able to do that and um, you know in best of three once you get familiar with the list then you can start you know tuning stuff you know you notice that another deck is, has got some new innovation and you can make an adaptation to your deck to kind of combat that maybe you notice that there's an uptick in a certain other deck you know maybe like maybe black white angels is suddenly seeing a resurgence or people are generally playing more blue white control you can make adaptations to your deck in order to change depending on what the meta is doing whereas in best of one you can't really do that because you know say for example you notice that the graveyard you know you're playing is it wizards for example and you notice that the graveyard decks are becoming a lot more popular like dragonstorm or reanimator or greasefang for example like I explained earlier, there's a real risk to trying to put Graveyard Hate in your main deck in best of one because it just makes you worse against everything else. So if you notice, you know, you're playing Is It Wizards and all these Graveyard combo decks are becoming a lot more popular, the smart thing to do at that point is to change decks rather than innovate. You can't really innovate in best of one unless you're making a completely new deck or you're making your deck more linear and more powerful somehow. You can't really go, okay, there's more graveyard stuff so I can run this graveyard hate card as a way to shut that off because it just makes you worse against everything else. Whereas in best of three, you really can do that if that makes sense. Um, and like I said earlier, even if you do make an innovation in best of one, it's really hard to get an edge against the rest of the field because there's so much extra variance in the format in general. So even if you do manage to come up with a brand new deck that's really powerful, you're still going to lose a decent amount of games because you queued into a bad matchup. You're still going to lose a decent amount of games because you ended up losing the die roll, for example. Um, and also, you know, best of one changes to the meta often result in you needing to change your deck rather than make changes because it's so linear, like I said. Uh, one last advantage of best of one that I see a lot of people bring up as well is that you're more likely to face a variety of decks because you play more games versus different opponents as well. So you're more likely to see a bigger variety of decks. But I, I only think that's the case in the short term, really. You know, sure, it's probably the case that if you play an hour of best of one, you're more likely to face more different decks than if you played an hour of best of three. But in the long term, I actually think you're more likely to see a bigger variety of decks in best of three because there are way more viable options. You know, because of the very linear, the very fast nature of best of one, if your deck isn't able to compete with, you know, the Red White Thopters deck racing, the Is It Wizards deck racing, the Dragonstorm or Greasefang decks racing, then your deck isn't going to be viable. Whereas in Best of Three, where there's way more counterplay and these sorts of very linear, very one-track decks aren't as popular, there's a much, much bigger variety of decks that are viable. You know, in Historic, you've got, like, fringe decks like Shamans, you've got fringe decks... Well, I guess Auras isn't really a fringe deck as much, but there, there's a ton of more fringe decks you know mono blue spirits in historic there's a ton of viable options that are very strong that just aren't viable in best of one because they're too slow to keep up so in terms of deck variety i actually think you're more likely to see more decks playing best of three going forward so overall that the whole point i was trying to make here is that if you're a competitive player your end goal overall should be to try and reduce variance wherever you can you know Variance is an inherent part of magic in general, but if you're trying to play competitively, your whole goal is to try and build your deck in such a way that it's always going to give you reasonable draws, that you're always going to be able to give yourself a good chance to win the game. And I think best of one, with the additional variance of the matchup disparity, the additional variance of going first or second, the inability to really make innovations because of the way the decks are built, it's just really difficult to... Um, how to phrase it, it's, it, it's really difficult to give yourself an edge in best of one, especially because you also don't rank up that much on the ladder when you're playing it as well. And I also finally think that playing best of three will just make you a better player in general overall, because I definitely think there's kind of a skill plateau if you just play best of one, because you have less agency over the outcome of the matches, you know. Like I said earlier, if you're playing the perfectly built elves deck and you're playing it flawlessly, 
there's still a ton of matches that you're going to lose because you don't have control over how things pan out. Whereas in best of three, you have so much more agency in the outcome of those games because you choose, you know, if you're struggling against a certain matchup, you can tweak your sideboard to have more cards to bring in in that matchup. If you ended up getting cheesed out game one, you still have two opportunities. You know, if you miss land drops, which is another thing I haven't even brought up at all, you know, obviously you're playing magic. Some, day, some games you're going to draw too many lands, some games you're not going to draw enough. If that happens for one of the games, you still have two more games to still potentially win. So I think if you're just, even if you're somebody who plays best of one because you're kind of new to competitive magic and it helps you get wins against better players, I think in the long term you're just much, much better off playing best of three because it's a way of giving yourself more agency. It's a way of giving yourself more control over the outcome of the games, if that makes sense. So that's that's my overall take on it. I, I just generally think that if you're somebody who just plays best of one, you should really consider giving best of three a go. The only real reasons personally why I would stick with best of one is if my pet deck was like Dragonstorm or something that you can't really play in best of three, or you just don't really have much time to commit to playing best of three matches. But if you're someone who just plays best of one and you're kind of on the offense, or maybe you're a little intimidated, or you just don't feel like you have the knowledge to build a sideboard yet, I would just go for it. I would just go into best of three because I think the gameplay is a lot more fun. You have way more control over the outcome of the matches. It will help you improve as a player and you'll get to the point where you're able to innovate on top decks, which can give you a real edge against the rest of the field as well. So anyway, that's my take on it. Let me know what you think about it in the comments. Let me know if you think I've missed anything out at all. And again, since this video is kind of different to the rest of the videos that I've posted, definitely let me know if you liked it and I'll try and make more in future. Again, on the flip side, if you're only interested in the deck guide videos, also let me know in the comments below. But yeah, anyway, that's the video. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll catch you on the next one. Big up.